The official Wheel of Time Season 2 trailer is the gift that just keeps on giving. Here are more than 20 secrets and Easter eggs I missed in my previous breakdown. This is Unraveling the Pattern. I'm Lauren. As always, you can skip ahead as desired by navigating the chapters below on the YouTube timeline or by looking at the chapters in the description. This video includes full story spoilers and speculation for the first two seasons of the TV show and for the first three Wheel of Time books through The Dragon Reborn. As always, if you wish to remain completely spoiler free, this video might not be for you. Please like the video to help me get more reach on YouTube. Please subscribe to the channel and please consider supporting the WGA and SAG AFTRA strike by donating to one of the provided links in the description. If you wish to support me through Patreon or here on YouTube as a member, or by dropping a tip like these awesome people, I will be donating these funds to the strikes for the foreseeable future. These aren't in any particular order, but let's discuss all of the Moraine Easter eggs I missed first. In the opening shot of the trailer, Moraine appears to be standing in the foregate just outside of Kyrian, but I failed to notice that her Kisiera, you know, the blue jewel she always wears on her forehead in the books, might be different from the one she has in Season 1. In the books, Moraine actually uses her Kisiera as a focus point for the One Power to help her do things like spy on people or train new channelers. In the show, it first appears when she's teaching Egwene how to touch the One Power. Other than that, Moraine only seems to wear it when she's dressed in her formal attire. We first see her wearing it when she's summoned to the Armalin seat in episode 6 of season 1. And this shot from the trailer appears to show her wearing formal clothing, perhaps before attending a party at Lord Barthanus's manor in Kyrian. My guess is that the jewel is the same, but the chain and the jewel casing she uses are different depending on her outfit. Actually, looking closely at the shot from Episode 2, the chain doesn't match the chain that she's wearing later in Episode 6, so I believe she just swaps it out for a different chain and jewel casing. It is also possible that she has more than one Kisiera. Another small Moraine detail is that she seems to have a sword on her back in this quick shot, where she appears to be running away from something. Is this a sword? Why would Moraine have a sword? I suppose since she won't be able to channel, at least in the start of the season, that she'll be looking for other ways to defend herself, so having a sword might make sense. She also has a knife in this shot, which is the same knife she uses on Rand's neck in the finale in Season 1. Speaking of Rand's neck and Moraine, this shot of Rand choking Moraine was intriguing to me, but I failed to notice that Rand has blood on his neck, similar to the wound from Moraine's knife in the finale. Remember in Book 3 when Rand is alone, he's constantly being haunted both in his dreams and while awake by people who appear to him as people he knows, like Egwene or Moraine. It gives a real sense of Rand becoming unhinged and going mad as he lashes out at these apparitions. In some cases, his friends really do visit Rand in his dreams, but he doesn't believe they're real and he tries to kill them. There's even a point when he kills a whole group of people who approach him to share his fire. He doesn't realize until after he kills them all that there was a gray man or a gray woman among them. Anyway, I think something similar is happening in this scene. I think either this isn't really Moraine and Rand recognizes that, or this is actually Moraine but Rand will not believe it's her at first. I'm kind of worried about more fake out deaths in this show, but if done well, this could be really interesting if he kills Moraine in this moment, only to realize it's a dream or a dark friend with her face. Anyway, I think Rand will be facing the same sort of manipulation and madness at the start of Season 2, and I think Ishamayel will be taunting him in his dreams. I wouldn't be surprised if this wound on Rand's neck is sustained while in a dream, as he's reminded by what Moraine tried to do to him in the finale. Or perhaps this wound is still fresh from his experience at the Eye of the World. Back to Moraine. I joked about this bath shot in my breakdown, but someone in my comments reminded me that we saw Moraine in a bath in the pilot episode where she appeared much happier and she was able to use the one power to warm the water. I could be warmer. I love the contrast between that and this new scene. Just knowing this makes me feel like the water is probably cold and uncomfortable, which is a great way to show that Moraine is constantly being reminded of her loss of the one power from the end of season one. By far the detail that was most pointed out to me in the comments of my breakdown was that this scene of Moraine and Swan kissing is very likely a flashback. There are three hints that this does take place in the past or that it could be a mirror world or alternate reality. First, Swan doesn't appear to have her arm tattoos in this shot. Moraine even comments on her new tattoos when they meet up in the fish hut back in season one. These are new. So, sometime between this scene in the trailer and the meeting between Swan and Moraine in season one, Swan got more tattoos. Second, Moraine's hair actually appears to be quite a bit longer in this shot than it is in any other scene, which again implies this either happened in the past or is some sort of alternate reality or flicker mirror world sequence. Third, Swan's wearing blue. As the Amarlin seed, she probably wouldn't be wearing the colors of her Aja. I like to think that this isn't an alternate world, but that this scene might take place just before or after Swan and Moraine are raised to be Aes Sedai. 
Perhaps we'll get to see the scene of Guitar Amoroso foretelling the birth of the dragon on Dragon Mount. I originally speculated that this wide shot of Tarvalon from the trailer might be a part of that since we can see someone wearing blue here, but then I thought maybe it wouldn't be possible for Tarvalon to look this green and vibrant if it happens during the same time as the blood snow. However, Tam did go up to Dragon Mount specifically to cool off, so I suppose the snow that's visible here might not be everywhere. You can even see Tarvalon in the distance, and it doesn't appear to be covered in snow. I already mentioned that there might be two fades in this scene with Lan, but I wasn't totally sure. Well, it turns out that Daniel Henney actually mentioned in an interview that he was fighting with two swords against multiple fades, so I definitely think that's what this scene is. Also, I already made a short video about this, but I think I know who this man with the fire sword is, and I think it's the same mysterious character from this previous teaser shot. You should watch my other video for more information. However, something I wanted to point out that I really like is that what if all power rot blades actually catch on fire when they're used against a fade? Perhaps there isn't an Aes Sedai channeling weaves of fire onto the sword like I originally speculated, but maybe it just lights up with fire weaves when it kills a fade. It's hard to be sure, but there doesn't seem to be any fire near the hilt as the sword pulls back out of the Fade's chest. This next one gave me pause because I'm convinced this is the Dark Friend social scene and not a gathering of the Forsaken. There are only 12 chairs, and this definitely appears to be Pat and Fane here, but in this new version of the shot, there are 13 people visible. I subscribe to the theory that we won't be getting all 13 Forsaken in the show, and that they'll probably be consolidated down into 8 or 9 characters, but the fact that there are 13 people visible in the scene is certainly intriguing. Also regarding this shot, there's there's been some discussion about who this person is. It looks like a little girl, which feels oddly creepy and out of place, but somebody mentioned that this could be a Zomaran. Zomara are the sort of soulless servants that Ishamayel uses during the Dark Friend Social. According to one character, Zomaran are, quote, one of Agenor's less inspired creations, close quote. They're not useful for any task but serving. They are described as male or female looking, slender, beautiful, young appearing, and always smiling, with golden hair and dead black eyes. Could this be a Zomara? Next, this is just a little thing, but I forgot to point out that Avienda is smiling as she veils her face in this scene. I can't wait to hear her say something like, Do you like to dance, Perrin Ibarra? In this shot of Nynaeve, I failed to notice that Alana might also be wearing an apron here. It is green and not gray like Nynaeve or Egwene's, but could Alana be serving in the kitchens? Remember, there's some strangeness with Alana in Book 3, where she offers to pay penance and serve in the kitchens alongside Nynaeve, Egwene, and Elaine. Some thought that perhaps she wanted to use the opportunity to spy on the girls. Perhaps that's part of what we're seeing here. Some people pointed out that Leandrin's clothes appear to be a darker red, as if she's slowly transitioning from red to black. I believe they foreshadowed this all the way back in the pilot episode, when her ring sort of transitioned from red to black. Also, I speculated about this scene of Leandrin appearing at the Flame of Tarvalon, but my favorite new theory about this is that Leandrin is giving up her place as a red sister for good in this scene, and this will precede her joining the Black Aja. Do you think she's actually going to give up her Aes Sedai ring entirely though? Seems to me like it would be more advantageous to keep her ring, even if she changes her Aja. Speaking of Leandrin, this scene was speculated to take place in North Harbor, but somebody pointed out to me that there's a wagon in the background that might belong to a certain peddler. Do you think this is Pat and Fane's wagon here? Comparing it to other shots of his wagon that we've seen so far, I'm not sure I'm convinced. They don't seem to match, but I like the idea that Pat and Fane is the man in North Harbor that Moraine knows about. Perhaps he got a new wagon since his visit to the Two Rivers on Winter Night. There were just a few lines of dialogue in the trailer, and I still believe this is a Shamile's voice, but some people think this could be Elias who is saying, You know you have something inside you. Something that calls for blood. It would be fitting if Elias was using this line to teach Perrin. One minor thing is that I originally assumed that Egwene was talking to Elaine in this scene when she talks about helping her friends, but I realized that this person is probably not Elaine, but Nynaeve. This means that this shot of Elaine might not even happen during this same scene. I kind of mentioned this in another video, but I didn't draw attention to it in my breakdown. I love that Egwene is channeling a sort of shield of air here, but she's not using her hands to channel. I think that Egwene learned from Eamon Valda that using her hands to channel is a crutch. I like to believe that Nynaeve and probably Elaine will also not be using their hands to channel all of the time. And speaking of channeling, someone on Reddit pointed out this awesome detail. Each time we see weaves of the One Power being channeled in the trailer, they look different depending on the channeler. The Aes Sedai weaves look more smooth, but still wispy and thin. Egwene's are less smooth and seem a bit thicker. The Shanchan weaves look very subdued and almost rigid. Rand's weaves look more chaotic and erratic. But my favorite detail is that Ishamayel's weaves look nearly perfect, very smooth and clear and straight. He's clearly the most experienced channeler. That also brings up the question about these weaves surrounding Rand with Selene behind him. I believe these weaves are coming from Rand, but that he's not necessarily in control of them because he's being tempted by the large Chodan Kal statue in this moment. 
But I also like the theory that these weaves might be coming from Celine, and that she's trying to mess with Rand in some way. I do think there are little bits of noticeable darkness or corruption in these weaves though, so I'm sticking with my theory that these are from Rand. There's been some discussion about this woman in blood who looks like she came from the ring, and whether or not she's Lanfear. To me, it's obviously her. Remember the dark prophecy from book two? Here's just part of that prophecy. Daughter of the night, she walks again. The ancient war, she yet fights. Her new lover, she seeks. Who shall serve her and die, yet serve still? Who shall stand against her coming? The shining walls shall kneel. Blood feeds blood, blood calls blood. Blood is, and blood was, and blood shall ever be. Now tell me this isn't Lanfear. This isn't so much an easter egg as something that occurred to me after I posted my previous video. I suggested that perhaps Swan brought Loghain to Kyrian specifically to meet Rand, and perhaps she did it against the will of the Hall of the Tower. But I actually like the idea that Loghain is being paraded around different cities, just like he was in Tarvalon in Season 1, as a way to show people that the Aes Sedai are still in control. So perhaps Loghain is just on his world tour with the Armalin when he meets up with Rand in Kyrian. Much has been said about the pacifiers on the Damane and other Shanchan servants, but something I noticed later is that Turok has these interesting ear coverings. I love and hate the idea that the voice of the Shanchan High Blood is considered so sacred that not only do they not allow their servants and slaves to speak, but they assign someone to speak for them, and they even cover their own ears as a sort of symbol that they will not listen to or hear the words of people below them. Can you imagine Turok actually listening to the words of someone beneath his station? I really like this detail. Or maybe they're just Bluetooth earphones. I also like that Turok isn't just clean shaven on his head, but he doesn't even have eyebrows. Makes me wonder about the carpet, if you know what I mean. Also related to Shanchan costumes, I sort of mentioned this in my breakdown video, but I wanted to specifically draw your attention to High Lady Surat's headdressing here, specifically these raven wings or horns or whatever they are. Now look at this shot of the person sitting on a throne in what I assume is a dream where Rand is tied to the wheel. Notice how the shape of this person's headgear seems to match the shape of Surat's costume. This just reinforces my theory that Surat might not be who we think. And last but not least, my favorite detail that I previously missed is that Rand actually appears to have a heron on the hilt of his sword in this shot. This is a huge detail because his heron mark sword from season 1 didn't have a heron on the hilt. It was only on the scabbard and the blade. So the question is, are they adding the heron to the sword hilt without really saying anything, hoping we won't notice the continuity error? Or could Rand actually be getting a new sword at some point in season 2? The weird thing is that the heron is not present in this promotional image of this same scene that they shared a few weeks ago. Do you think it was photoshopped out? I'm very excited about this because this could mean that we might be getting the heron brands on his hands after all. There is a prophecy from book two that says, twice and twice shall he be marked, twice to live and twice to die. Once the heron to set his path, twice the heron to name him true. Once the dragon for remembrance lost, twice the dragon for the price he must pay. I originally didn't think that Rand would get the heron brands on his palms. It seems impractical and too complicated to add makeup to the palms of an actor's hands for a TV show. But also it feels like a repeat beat that might impact future spoilery things that I won't get into here. That said, I'm always happy when the show follows more closely with the book, so now I'm really hoping that Rand will have herons branded into at least one of his palms in the show. I also like the idea that he'll add the heron to the hilt at some point to indicate that he's a blade master or something. This timing feels off, as I don't think Rand will become a blade master officially until after he kills Turok, if that even happens in the show. But I guess we'll just have to watch and find out. Thanks for watching. Remember to keep your comments respectful. Until next time, let the dragon ride again on the winds of Prime.